when I was at school, you know, we, we used to be forced to read people like, uh, in a Michael Gove style, you know, we used to be forced to learn by heart the poetry of Sir Henry Newbolt, Rudyard Kipling, Alfred Tennyson, Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, all those 19th century and people, you know, and even before that, you know, Andrew Marvel. You know, we were forced to learn them, you know, at school. And uh, I don't, I can't speak for the whole school, but everybody in our class really liked poetry. Mm. <laughs> Do you still read that kind of stuff now? No, I remember. I don't have to read it. It's in my head. You know, I don't have to read it because I, I was forced to learn it when I was a young boy. So I don't have to read it. I don't read any poetry, really, and apart from my own, after I've just written it, to be honest. You know, I, I don't really keep up to date with it. You know, I know people that are very good at writing poetry, but in order to read it in a public space, you have to think that you're just the best. Otherwise, why would you do it? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, so I don't really kind of keep abreast of modern poetry, but I know it was good. It's a kind of, I wouldn't say it was a sixth sense. And I don't know really how to explain it, but I don't spend a lot of time in my life reading the poetry yeah. of other people. So how do you feel now then? Obviously you were big into poetry when you were at school. Now your poems are getting analysed in schools. I think it's great, you know, because it's um, it obviously it's introduced me to a whole new generation of fans and they, they really like my stuff and now there's no such thing as a typical Johnny Clark fan. You know, they could be like 16 or literally 16 to 75. You know, they, they could be interested. I've looked at my audiences and I can see, you know, there is no typical demographic you couldn't want for more than that you know i really think that i'm like the people's choice can you remember a, a particular time like i know you said you started reading poetry at school but when you started actually writing words yourself and thinking ah oh, you know i've got something to say and was it a big part of your family life like did your mum and dad used to read a lot and write a lot not really my my mum was a great reader you know she she was always reading three books at a time from the public library and things like that you know and uh, and, you know, I'm quite old, you know, and we didn't get a TV till I was, like, 12 years old. So all my childhood, and I was very ill when I was a kid, you know, I had tuberculosis, so I had to spend a lot of time in bed, so I did a lot of reading. And a lot of that reading was stuff that might not have been sort of what somebody at my age would normally be reading, perhaps. You know, I'm only guessing there, you know, but... A lot of my pleasure in life has has been through reading books. I don't know whether I just answered your question or not. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> like you say schooling can like affect kids and that, and obviously it affected you with like that's where you cut your love for poetry from, isn't it? Yeah. Were you a big lover of school or is it made you, you know, no, the system? School. Yeah. Oh, I hated every every part of school apart from the bit where I was introduced to the English language and what it taught me literacy and for that, you know, I mean, you know, it, when you're a child, you know, you think you know everything but you don't know anything, so I'm really very grateful. You know, even though I hated school, that doesn't mean to say that they didn't, you, you know, why should you like it? Why should you like it? You're not there to like it, you're there to learn stuff that you don't know already. And I don't see that happening now in schools, you know, I, I meet teachers and things like that. You know, and, and you know, they, they kind of have it a go at Michael Gove, and I've never voted Conservative in my life, and I don't intend to start now, you know what I'm saying? I have to agree with Michael Gove there, you know, you... you when you, you know, teach people poetry, you don't teach them the meaning of it. How can they know they're 12 years old and this was written by a 35-year-old man? How can they know, or possibly know the meaning of it? No, you have to learn those words off by heart. And then when you're 34, then you'll understand. I think poetry, like, I don't know if you agree with me, it's open to interpretation. It's what means to one person can mean to another person. So if people tell you, you know, this is what yeah, it means... Yeah, but the best poets don't leave you any leeway. Mm -hmm. The best poets don't leave it up to your imagination. So is that what you try to do with your work? Do you try to get I to that point? I try to do everything. I try to do everything so nobody has to, look, has to use their imagination. No guess, blunt, no straight guess. down the line, barrel of the gun. That, this is what it means. You know what I mean? I do my best. Maybe some people take away. I've seen people, I've read their theses where they've got a PhD in my stuff. And it's like, well, I never thought of it like that. But, you know, I read other people's ideas of my stuff and it might be completely different from mine. And I just, and I just kind of think, great that I've started that train of thought in some very clever person's 
brain. From east of Sweden, Peter Stilson, Jimmy Zilch and the Scandaleros, Billy Doss, Sombreros. If you're good, you know, you aim at one target and hit a million, you know what I mean? You won't hit one target if you aim at a million. Salvador Dali said it right, you know, in order to be universal, you must be ultra-local. What do you think he meant by that? You know, travel is a mistake. You're not going to learn anything by going to another country. You won't learn anything about the state of mankind through travel. Can you remember the like defining moment when you went from writing to performing? Was there like a what was the transition? Well, when I started writing poetry, I started sending stuff off. A lot of my friends were art students, and I started sending things off to magazines, and they would print the odd bit, but obviously there was no money in that. Little Ronaldo, his sister Dolores, her cakes are very Moorish. Admit anybody who knows my brother, for anybody who says she's the mother of any child... I'm you know, and I thought, you know, how do I become a professional poet, you know? And I thought, well, the only really way to do that is to... Do my stuff, read my stuff, re recite my stuff in places where you might not expect to find poetry. Because there weren't any places where you, you know, oh, come and read your poetry. Or so. That didn't exist when I, when I started writing. So I thought, you know, that I could use incongruity to my own advantage by doing gigs at cabaret clubs, jazz clubs, before the punk thing. And then the punk thing came and I thought, that's where all the young people yeah, are. That's yeah. where everybody's going. That's, that's the, the, the big thing. And Howard DeVoto was then the singer with the Buzzcocks. And because I looked right, because I didn't, I wasn't a hippie, you know, I had short hair and tight trousers. And he said, you know, you, sh you shouldn't be doing these places, you should be doing places where we play, you know, art colleges and punk clubs. And I knew about punk because I'd been to see the Sex Pistols and Ramon. Hey, oh, let's go. I said, you, you know, you really think I could, you know, there's a place for me. And they said, well, you look, right, you look right, give it a bit of a go, you know what I mean? And the stuff, you, and, the, and they said, you know, the lyrics you write are the same kind of thing that Joe Strummer and mm. Mick Jones write about, you know, just everyday life. That was the jump between writing poetry and performing. I'd done it before, I'd done it in cabaret, I tried to make it in cabaret, uh, jazz clubs, obviously the odd folk club here and there, but mainly jazz clubs in Manchester because that was the big thing for kind of bohemians, you know what I mean, in the midst. And then I thought, you know, well, I, I want to make a living at it. You know what I mean? I want to make a... So how do, how do you write? Do, do you think of something straight away and you just go, 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 scribble, 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 or do you take time, or what kind of process is well, it? Well, no, scribble, 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 and then maybe one... It's never finished. A poem is never finished. It's merely abandoned. You know what I mean? Yeah, it gets yeah. then something else comes up. You know, I've never finished a poem. You know, you know what I mean? It's it's really weird. I mean, it's very organic. Well, the way I work is very organic. It's about as organic as you can get. You don't even need a guitar. You, you don't even need literacy. You can speak it into a dictaphone. You know what I mean? It's the most accessible poetic form. As the rap scene has proved, you yeah, know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's the most accessible mode of expression that there is. Do you think there's still a niche for like spoken word and poetry? Because I know you mentioned rap there. They'll probably say that they're doing their spoken word in their own genre. Do you think it's still prominent in today's culture and society? Absolutely, because language is something that you might not paint, you might not play a guitar, but you talk. You could take it back 4,000 years, I'm sure. Do you think there's, any... there's always been somebody like me for 4,000 years. That's why I don't worry about the internet. I don't worry. I ain't got a computer. I ain't got a mobile phone. I ain't got none of that. I'm not, I'm low tech. What I do is primitive. Yeah, all right, I've got a sophisticated take on the world. You know, that I will admit. But the way I convey my sophisticated take on the world is via something that everybody has access to. What any advice would you give to any writers out there or spoken word artists or poets who are trying to make it and thinking, you know, I don't think I can get out there and be heard? What would you say to them? Keep it up, you know, it's the one mode of expression that can never be taken away.